Okay, everyone, please take your seats. Okay, everyone, please take your seats. Welcome to the OWASP London chapter. This is a hybrid meetup. We are live streaming this meetup on our YouTube channel. And uh, we are at this wonderful venue of the company called Thought Machine. Um, my name is Sam Stepanian. I'm OWASP London chapter leader. We also have Andra. Andra, where are you in your audience? Andra, you want to wave? Uh, we have Andra, uh, uh, who's a co-leader. Uh, Sharif, unfortunately, is uh, on holiday at the moment, so he cannot uh, join us today. But hopefully he will host our next meetup. If you're going to tweet about tonight's meetup, please use hashtag OWASPLondon and mention us on Twitter at OWASPLondon. We're also on all the other socials. The agenda for tonight is I'm going to do a quick update about OWASP and our upcoming conferences. Um, then we, we have Andrew who's going to talk about what are S-bombs and how they can make our software more secure. And then Anthony ha has to run very quickly for the train because he needs to catch a train from Houston to Manchester. So I'm very thankful for him to be able to come and present tonight. Um, uh, then we have Tal. Uh, talking about uh, risks of blind trust in code from strangers. The talk has been slightly modified, so Tal is going to also throw in a bit of AI in her talk. Then we're going to have a break, and we're going to have uh, Kaiwen talking about software composition analysis and unveiling pain points in SCA. Uh, then we're going to have a price uh, raffle, and then after that, we're all going to go to the pub. That's the usual uh, uh, set up of OWASP London chapter meetups. Uh, Raffle tonight, uh, I think the prize is kind of sponsored by Checkmarks. This is MetaQuest 2 VR headset. In order for you to get it, please scan this QR code. And uh, you, the personal details that you will be giving, you will be giving to the sponsor, not to us. And um, you will have a chance of winning this. If you stick until the end, um, I will show the QR code again. Okay, I hope everyone got it. Okay, uh, now, uh, how many people are here for the first time? By the show of hands, hey, lots of you. So thank you very much for finding us. If you want to uh, make sure you don't miss our next event, please do sign up to our mailing list, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Meetup, Eventbrite. We have a channel on YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, and we also um, have a channel on OWASP Slack called Chapter London. Uh, let me see if this YouTube video is going to work, because uh, that's the video talking about OWASP. Let me see if 
community of developers, technologists, and evangelists improving the security of software through tools and resources. OWASP has 100 plus active projects and new project applications are submitted. No, I think feedback is actually inter interfering with our lovely YouTube video, so I'm going to skip it. I hope people here already know uh, what OWASP is. Let me see if I can move on. Right, so one important thing about OWASP, which is mentioned in this video, is OWASP membership. And uh, there are some membership benefits. Uh, you can become a paid OWASP member. Uh, the, um, if you become a OWASP member, one of the benefits is that you get access to Secure Flag Application Security Training Platform. We also have a few other uh, offers from uh, AppSec Phoenix and Ubik, currently the uh, um, uh, benefits for OWASP members. However, tonight we're going to announce a brand new member benefit, and this is going to be a code bashing developer training platform, security training platform from Checkmax is going to be available hopefully from tomorrow for all paid OWASP members. So that's the new announcement. Uh, OWASP membership is 50 US dollars per year. For students, it's only 20 US dollars per year. If you represent the company, you can become a corporate supporter. If you want to become a member, you can just visit OWASP.org and click on the join button or go to OWASP.org slash membership. Um, so uh, the advantages of OWASP uh, membership, apart from uh, being able to vote and shape the uh, direction of uh, OWASP, uh, we can also get uh, discounts on many OWASP conferences in other global cybersecurity conferences like RSA, Black Hat, DEF CON, and many others. And of course, your um, uh, membership fee is a donation to your local chapter projects. You also get an OWASP email address with the G Suite um, workspace. And you also get this cool sticker, which you can only get from me, because there's, uh, it's a limited edition sticker. There's only a handful of uh, those remaining. You can see one attached to my laptop here. So uh, yeah, uh, if you're a member, please uh, come and approach me. I'll give you a sticker. If you become a member right now, just show me your confirmation from Stripe that you become a paid member. You'll get one. Also, um, uh, Andra, do you want to say a couple of words about 20th anniversary? I'll say it. OK. So la our last meetup was at the Google headquarters. And we celebrated the 20th anniversary because this year is 2024, is 20 years of OWASP London. Uh, we were actually founded in 2004. And to celebrate this, we had a great meetup uh, in February at the Google London headquarters. And we have some exclusive stickers. So there is still some stash of the stickers available. There's a VIP sticker. So people who are here, please, Andrew, do you want to raise your hand? Yeah, come on. See Andra to uh, get these stickers from her. Also, big thank you to all our sponsors who are sponsoring OWASP London. And uh, we have chapter supporters who uh, donate to OWASP and specifically designate that they would like to support the London chapter. If you want to see your logo here, please uh, come and talk to us. Uh, we will be happy to um, support you as well. And tonight we are actually hosted by Thought Machine, so I'd like to invite Daniel Blunder and uh, say a couple of words about this wonderful venue and this company. So first of all, welcome everyone. This is something that we're very happy to do and very proud to do and support OWASP, provide a facility, help with the meetings. I think this is something that's very important in our culture. Um, so very much welcome, enjoy everything you can that we're, we've brought out here and any questions about facilities or where you need to find anything, just let us know. I don't wanna go through product run-throughs because I hate when I go to conferences and I get that. However, there are two things I do wanna bring up. We have two open positions, one security engineer and one threat operations. If you know anybody, we are actively recruiting and hiring for those positions. So two, please have them look it up. If they have any questions, they can reach out to us, but definitely hiring. Other than that, enjoy the meetup. Very much appreciate everybody coming out and hope it's great. Excellent. Thank you very much, then. Thank you very much for hosting us. Um, right, very quickly, again, I'm just going to run through the slides. Uh, I started doing this uh, proof of attendance NFT. So, those of you who are 
uh, interested about blockchain, if you want to get an NFT, which is a digital proof of attendance, like a digital sticker, a digital badge, uh, that you were here tonight, please come and see me because you can scan it from my phone and uh, you can collect one of these collectibles. These are like uh, Pokemon nowadays. Uh, you got to go catch them all. We have lots of them already, and we had one exclusive one for the 20th anniversary. We have a merch store if you want to buy some merch. Uh, conferences, we have OWASP Global AppSec Lisbon coming up in June. Uh, please do register, send your developers, uh, uh, send your security people. Um, again, uh, a hack, if you want to attend this conference for free, you can volunteer. If you volunteer for eight hours at the conference, you get a free ticket. Uh, when the volunteering opportunity opens, I will email everyone on the mailing list and also send an announcement on Twitter. Um, also, we're going to be having a OWASP Global AppSec Conference in San Francisco in September. Also, uh, the um, call for papers is open. If you'd like to present at our big global conference in San Francisco, uh, please do submit your talk proposal. Or if you want to attend, do talk to your company to send you there. Uh, okay, lots of OWASP projects, uh, more than 250 open source projects. We've got OWASP Top 10 for LLMs, our latest and greatest project. Uh, Cyclone DX version 1.6 just released. I hope Anthony will cover that because it has some cool features. If you want to ask questions tonight, please use Slido Do System. There's an OWASP uh, meeting code to Slido Do slash OWASP. This way we'll be able to collect uh, questions, but we're also going to have a microphone and we'll ask questions from the audience as well. Now I'm going to introduce Anthony Harrison, who is an SBOM expert. And uh, he's been presenting SBOMs and uh, spreading the word about SBOMs at many, many uh, conferences. I think uh, last uh, OWASP bomb was OWASP Manchester, right, Anthony? Yeah, yeah, there you go. The students. Excellent. Excellent. Let's all welcome Anthony. Anthony, welcome. Uh, if, you, if you share your screen now, it should be good. Let's see. Let's try and get the technology. Technology, just share your screen. Right, where should we go? I can't see any glasses. Yeah, glasses are here. Desktop. And it's on the screen. Right, slides. Yes. Right, slideshow. Awesome. Microphone and slides. Good stuff. Right. Right. Hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, right. Okay, that's probably better. Right, I would have been in Mogwash, Manchester, because they have event exactly the same time. Um, but I've been two days here in um, the conference or an exhibition down at uh, Olympia. So I've had two days of talking to lots of people and sharing the goodness of F bombs. So. This talk is internal, entitled um, How S-Bombs Can Help You. In, when I gave this talk in Manchester last June, come on, why is that not working? I said they will help. That was June. I think they are now. We've, mo we've moved forward in nine months to now starting seeing S-Bombs actually getting valuable and starting to see people starting to see the traction that S-bombs can give you. A bit about me. Um, I started a long, long, long time ago in this industry when everyone's software was written proprietary by the team that delivered it. And I've worked in what you might call OT and defense. Big projects that take a long time to finish, never finish really. And the software is constantly evolving slowly. Lots of process. Um, I sort of retired so I could start writing open source software, again, officially. Um, and then someone said, you've got quite a lot of open source software. Let's try and make a business. So I set up a business, which is APH10, and I'm trying to sell um, software risk and the software supply chain, a business around that and how to make that more secure, because if you think about it, it's a big challenge. Software is everywhere. To some extent, software is out of control in some areas. So let's try and make a business out of that. Um, 
I like sharing as well. So I've, for the last 10 years, I've been uh, going around schools as a STEM ambassador, telling them the joys of what engineering is and software and technology and why maths is good. Uh, it's obviously work because both my sons are now in this in systems and computer teaching. So that's obviously worked. I also mentor. I mentor uh, students. Uh, I'm a mentor for the Google Summer of Code, which is just about uh, going through the current final stages of selecting the projects this year. Um, and I teach coding to code a dojo. And that's where the joy of Python sort of came from. Um, that is not an O wasp wasp. That's a Manchester B. <laughs> so if you go to Manchester, Manchester has something called the Digital Security Hub, which was set up to try and be an ecosystem for the cyber in the north, uh, northwest. Great, great thing set up about um, middle of 2022. Runs a load of startup programs. Great network. So everyone shows the Manchester B, which is, comes from a few years ago where everyone became very associated with the B. Bees work hard. That's what man unions do. Um, and I also have a life of running. So that's what I might be doing later, running to the train. Um, who remembers Lock for Shell? Who's still suffering? That's good. Did you enjoy that as well? <laughs> so did you handle this, this utility better than you did Lock for Shell in 2021? Or was it really a problem? So how many went, yippee, like I said, not a problem? Not many of you. Well, that's brave. Well done. I think most people are like that. That's the way most engineering managers are, most devs. It's not going to affect us, really, is it? But your customer wants to know. And when we get celebrity vulnerabilities, the media get a hold of it and then starts doom and gloom. And your CISO gets a bit iffy and says, all right, where are we? We need to be better. And if you think about software, certainly in my career, software's just got more and more complex. Don't, gone are the days where one engineer could understand a full application suite. Nobody understands all the software, how it all comes together. You've got different applications, infrastructure guys, app guys, etc. And that's bringing risk. This is the one, what I'll call the Rumsfeld, uh, Rumsfeld things, the unknown unknowns. How do you know the risk that you have got as a business if you're delivering your software to your customers? <coughs> if you don't know what's in your software, because we all know software is not perfect. Or maybe, maybe, maybe you all like perfect software, but I've never found that. Um, so if you don't know the risk, how can you answer the question, are we affected by any of these vulnerabilities? So you are now going, it's all about software billing materials. Hopefully, most of you have probably heard of software billing materials. But if you've not, I'll use my analogy. We all have some food. You go to a restaurant, what's the first thing you ever ask? Have you got any allergies? <coughs> And they're trying to protect themselves because we know if you had an allergy and, they, and you didn't know, they didn't know about it, you could have a bad allergic reaction and we don't want the consequences of that. But if you actually look at a burger, that's where a burger really comes from. It's got lots of suppliers. Beefs come from where? Maybe they've generated, they've built their own, um, grown their own vegetables, maybe made their own buns. But there's a load of people involved creating that product. And hopefully that product is fresh. So the, the, the food has probably got a sell-by date. And actually, when you go to a burger, my son won't have the tomatoes, but I will have, we'll have different configurations of that burger. Shift that to software. You all have product configurations, different settings, maybe for different customers. What's the sell-by date? That's your end of support or end of life. All the suppliers that they've got, do you know where they're coming from? Do you know exactly what that chain is? So if that chain got disrupted, you would know, do you might have an alternative supplier? So if the beef didn't come from wherever, they would go. To, they would know they could get somewhere else. Can you do that with your software?
So S bomb is formal. It's not to be kept in a locked cabinet just as a PDF printed off and never never read. The big thing about S bombs is this information is captured by your maybe build team, but shared within your organization because your organization will get different values depending on what they're looking for, whether it's the governance people, whether it's the product people, whether it's the dev people. And it's all about risk. It's not about technical. It's about your risk that your software that you have built through your building blocks are potentially exposing your business to. Uh, there's been a lot of actions. So we all remember solar winds. <coughs> if you notice, there's a little bit of a pattern. Generally, you tend to find these big vulnerabilities happen just before Christmas. You're going to see that later on. Hopefully, we'll see another slide. Um, so the consult there have been consultations. Solar winds then upset. The US government got a little bit concerned. So they said we need to look at the software supply chain. They came up with something called the US exec order. Exo Order 14228, May 2021, a landmark in software supply chain security. And that came up with a set, we need to be more transparent with all our software. And what they also came up with is, in the same way we have like EPC ratings for houses and energy ratings for your white goods, we wanted to have an EPC rating for software. I don't think that's there yet, but it's a nice, nice idea. So you can compare software. Then Log4j happened. If people had had S-bombs and all the tooling that we need now for Log4j, people would not have spent the thousands of hours trying to find out whether they're affected. So I think the 9th of December 2021 is the day the software world realised we need to do things differently. Then Linux Foundation came up with a, a report to say, are we ready for this S-bomb thing now? We've seen the exec order-ish. Mm, so then OpenSSF then came up with 10 work streams and quite a bit of funding from some of the big tech companies in the US starting to look at how we improve the software supply chain, the tooling, the processes, et cetera. And one of them was called S-bomb Everywhere, which is all about education and maybe tooling to support the process. The one challenge I think is people got a mess message that S-bombs just had to be generated. Nobody thought about how they were to be used. And that is where I think we really need to focus on. Generation is relatively easy. Generation and understanding them is a bit harder. Um, Europe then got in the act, Cyber Resilience Act. In normal U EU things, it's taken a while but they want to do exactly the same. Any software-based product needs to have this transparency. That's quite a big change for anyone, any business selling into Europe. Think of it as CE marking for software. And there's a, fairly, there's a whole lot of things. You can have a completely different talk all about COA. Um, plenty of people in Europe are making a lot of noise about what that means in terms of process. UK then sort of did a consultation early 2023. Um, really say, should we be doing something similar? There's somebody was, maybe. Personally, I think, why wouldn't we? They came up, maybe some, some industries, sectors may benefit. Vulnerabilities don't care what sector it is, it's a vulnerability. Log for shell in finance, log for shell in retail, log for shell in defense, it's the same thing, it's a problem. <laughs> So we should be practicing it. What's probably more important is the medical device market in the States and the federal drug agency for any medical device now sold in the US market has to have this software transparency, has to have a software bill of materials available, has to declare any vulnerabilities that are available when it releases the product. You speak to medical device markets, most people never really knew what the software was, not to the depth that's now required. They didn't want to reveal that. So feel that's where we have to. And then the COA, I think, may get, um, depends on EU elections, which I've lost track of when that is now. Um, 
that will that might become statute middle of the year. Three years, 2027, it will be law. So there will be a transition period about things, but actually there will be a significant number of processes and guidelines required that software organisations will have to do or their products will have to go through. So it's quite a lot, there's quite a lot of work potentially, I think, from what they where we are now to where you need to get to. Right. Right. Two standards. One's from the OWASP world, was released earlier, updated um, two weeks ago. And it introduced some further things. And you'll see the slide later on about what it covers. Um, but it's really going to try and document, provide an awful lot more of documentation about your software and its components. Really great. SPDX announced their version, updated version, on Tuesday. I haven't looked at it in detail, but I know it doesn't cover some of the stuff that Cyclone DX currently has in 1.6. They haven't got everything done. They've broken components down to, to in a slightly different way. Both are standards. Shame we've got two, but they're there. Use them. But basically, they're the same. You have metadata, you have components, you have relationships. Relationships are quite important. That's where you find A is dependent on B, is dependent on C, is dependent on D. Really important. <laughs> and that's where I think a lot of value that people have never had before suddenly comes apparent. And you're all, for, you're all practicing the secure development lifecycle, aren't you? So you're doing all these checks all the time. Maybe. Sometimes. I run dev teams and I wouldn't let them use any third party software unless I could say, is it licensed, is it tested, is it maintained? It's really hard to govern that. If everyone's just freely downloading stuff from GitHub. <laughs> but you should be doing this. You need to know what's going in there as, a dev, as dev teams, dev managers. You need the oversight. So S bombs are not just for devs. S bombs should all be for the security team, the governance team. And I have a mantra if you generate it, you should use it. Because the information that your dev team provides, the governance team will find the value. What license are you using, for example? That might be a very interesting question. Does it line up with our corporate policy about third party licenses? And I see a, I see a supply chain there from developers through a supplier, through integrators to an end user. But that's incremental, isn't it? Just move it along. You continue, you're always, at, you know, the end user is always just the next one on the chain. Uh, Cyclone DX has a huge tool set, which is really good. Mixture of open source and proprietary. I've got a few tools on there. Uh, it's continually growing. But this is the life cycle I suggest that you use for S-bombs. Generates the start. So maybe, maybe you get your build team. Your pipeline, your CICD comes out of your build. Then you should start looking at what's inside. I think you might be surprised what you find. Really valuable some stuff. I'll show you some of the things I found when I did a, did a study uh, a few months ago. And then that should tell you what you're going to prioritize. You're going to find problems. Then you need to prioritize those problems. You're not going to fix them all. So prioritize them, and then you go remediate, and then you go around again, because it's continual. Your baseline's continually changing. And Mr. CISO's probably quite happy because he's got control, he's got oversight. The solar wind CISO has been taken to court, the SEC has taken to court, because his process wasn't, wasn't being followed. And his CISO's in the room, are you worried? Are your, preso are your processes being followed by your dev team? Let's try and help. Because you don't want this. This is a classic cat, and I've seen every variance of this, because there was a one for about the XZ utils. Yes, change the text, it's still the same message. There's a bit of component that everybody relies on. If it goes AWOL, what happens? Do you know what that piece of com co code is? Do you know all your suppliers all the way down your supply chain? What happened if that broke? 
How would you fix it? You'd be surprised what some of the software that everyone's got in, they, they know, and how it's been maintained. A lot of that's open source by, by volunteers. For every business worked out what that piece of open source software that's been maintained by a developer out of the freedom of his heart because he likes doing software for fun, just give him $5,000 to keep him happy. He'd be delighted, but you, it's good value. So some of the insights I've shown, and then they're going to show some further things, and I'm going to have to bomb along because I'm looking at the time. Right. Um, some of the things you're going to find, if you've got S-bombs, you, you don't have one S-bomb, you have a whole suite of S-bombs. Have you got multiple versions of the same component across different builds, different applications? That could be proprietary or it could be open source. What does that mean? Are you maintaining them different versions? Could be good reasons. Are they being, can you say whether each component is actively being maintained? Are you, can, can you look at that? Can you see when it was last updated? It's not been updated for a couple of years. That might be an indication the, the maintainer might have got other things he'd like, they'd rather be doing. Are any of those components vulnerable to you? And how does that vulnerability affect you? Does it affect you? Are you supporting the, your, your, your suppliers and your communities? Think of OWASP. That might be a good example. Are you supporting the OWASP, the great work the OWASP does? Licenses, open source licenses. I find UK, we're not quite as strict as with, in the way we use open source licenses as Europe is. But actually, if you use the licenses the wrong way, then potentially that makes your commercial product potentially not viable if you've used the wrong software licenses. So are you checking them before it becomes too late? I know some, some companies going, trying to go through a, um, a merger in M&A they started looking at this and they said, I'm not, I'm not acquiring this because this won't be in my tech stack because the licenses are incompatible. Ultimately, I want to improve your security and I want to improve your resilience. So some of the things I found is nothing in an S-bomb currently says what the environment is. So I do Python. There's nothing in the, nothing in the S-bomb standards, even the updated ones that say, it's Python, it's running on Ubuntu, what versions? <coughs> Fortunately, Cyclone DX from OWASP allows you to do user-defined properties, which is what I do. SPDX is a bit harder. What I also found, if I, and I, most open source projects will target multiple versions of a language. Python's got five versions currently. If I built for each version, I got a different build. Different set of dependencies. How are you capturing that? So if you do the same policy save for Java, probably you get similar, similar. What I've found is later versions of languages have few dependencies. That's probably a good idea to say, are you up to date? Transitive dependencies are the hidden dependencies. They tend to change more frequently than the, what I've noted with the direct ones, but that was just a, my application. Licensed licenses, there's something called SPDX license identifiers. There's an official license identifier for every license, and there's about three or 400 licenses. Apache 2 is Apache-2.0, not Apache space 2. So if any of you look at open source software, look at the license. Can you make sure, put a simple pull request in to make the license correct? That will make my life so much simpler. SBOM quality, there's lots of quality tools. I wrote one of them. Um, SBOM quality is a variable feast. What's, what's, what's good, what does good look like? So the NTIA one is a minimum standard that the US government identified as what an SBOM component should have in it. Uh, the scorecard eBay came up with, I don't know why eBay did it, but it was, it was just a useful idea, a distant viewpoint. Um, there's a benchmark one looking at quality, look at the enrichment of data. An audit I just look and say, are you using the latest version of the software? Um, and that's an example of different things. These are all open source projects, I think. All look generating S bombs, and there's a um, this website assesses them. Go and look at the top one. <laughs> um, and then there's another thing: is I I built um, applications into a clean virtual clean virtual machine. 
to make sure I was getting the latest versions of all the software. And then I found it wasn't. That's was because the developers had pinned the dependencies. I didn't find that was nothing in the anything in the documentation, nothing, anything in the um, S bomb. It's only when I started analysing it, I did I find that. That was a real eye opener. There's a, there's a story behind that which I'll maybe sh I won't be able to share, but another day. Um, but what it's saying is, data <coughs> metadata is really important to as a community. Please help the metadata get better. Data enrichment. I want people to put as much data in their sponsors as possible because the more data in there, the more value people are going to get from it and the more different users are going to get useful information. Then looking at how your components change. And this, this one was a really good one. I presented this at FOSDEM a few months ago. And the top one is just the number of dependencies that changed. Over time, over 12 months, you know, we were adding new features and various things were coming in. So you'd expect a few more dependencies come in. The bottom line is the red things, which is the number of components to change per week. And what we noticed is there's three peaks. First peak is around Easter. Second peak was the start of the European holidays, the end of July. And the third peak was Thanksgiving Day. What does that show you about open source maintenance? They tend to do maintenance at holiday time. So that could be a strength, it could be a weakness, because that means maybe there's a lot of people put dodgy soft, dodgy defects at holiday time as well. But that was a really interesting insight that I only got because I analyzed a year's worth of S bombs for the same build. And this was where, just as a way of just showing how quick, quickly some components, some components were changing every week, some components were changing things. What we noticed when we looked at it, most of the changes were feature-led, not security-led. Devs like doing new features, they don't like fixing bugs, was where basically the conclusion. And when I started looking at old age of the last update, some of these were more than two years old. Again, that was quite useful because what that highlighted was we were using an old version of a component that it actually was now included in the Python libraries and we missed that. So this was quite a useful way of capturing that. Right, I said I'd tell you what some of, some of the things that have happened in Cyclone DX 1.6 that got released last week. Um, software doesn't live on its own. Software lives on hardware. So there's a hardware bomb. Software generally supports services. So you have software as a service, which delivers your APIs that you're using. So Cyclone DX includes this enrichment. What he added last week was crypto bombs, C bombs, um, which is identifies which cryptos you're using in your services. And that's quite useful, is if you look at, you know, a lot of components support many different versions of the cryptos. Documenting which ones you're using will then, when you're doing your vulnerability analysis, will work out, well, am I affected? Well, we're using this, uh, and I'm not a crypto expert, so using crypto X. And if you said you looked in your S and your S or your S bomb, which has a C bomb in it, then, and we're not using that crypto, then we're not affected by the vulnerability. Great visibility. Removes, you know, you answer that question, you're happy days. Um, of course, it's got ML bombs for the AI. So that's documenting your data that's gone into your training training model, what type of model it, what's the pedigree, which model it's come from. But it's also added energy consumption, which is interesting. I was talking to someone this, this afternoon. You look at AI models, they are potentially quite big consumers of energy. Are you aware of that? So that's maybe other things. And I know SPDX is also looking at that same thing. Um, and they, they're, they're future ones looking at manufacturing and architecture. Um, OBOM, I'm a system of systems person. So it's really another SBOM. So it's a system of systems. And people, I believe people like Lockheed Martin are a great supporter of, of, of OWASP, have an SBOM, all the bombs, all the way down for an F-35. 
all the way down. So that will include traditional bill of materials for all widgets and all the electronics, but just for all the software. And that must be thousands of bill of materials. And S-bombs don't live on their own. So generally you've got some security. Salsas comes from the Linux Foundation. We won't talk about that. That's a supply chain thing. The one thing I want to talk about is VEX. Vulnerabilities happen. How do you share whether those vulnerabilities are false positives or not? So if you look at traditionally, when you build a system, how many, will, how many devs will clear a system that has no vulnerabilities? Show of hands. That's correct. No one will deliver vulnerable-free code. You can't. It's too big. But most of those vulnerabilities are not, not, not be material to your application because the vulnerability doesn't apply to the way your context. So how do you share that? VEX is a way of sharing that context. It says, we've assessed it, we are not affected. We've got countermeasures. We've got, basically, we're not using that version, of the, that um, function of the library that's vulnerable. So what's the VEX? VEXs will, will be issued continually between your baselines. You need to assess each vulnerability and document that in a VEX and share that with your downstream. And you should be being shared from your upstream, should be passing this to you. Fortunately, there are four standards. We have two standards for S-bombs. Now we've got four. CSAF, which has come from o Oasis, which is um, Cisco have had really been involved. Cyclone DX has had it. Uh, OpenVex is a very simple one that's come from the Linux Foundation. And SBDX now has one that got released on Tuesday, and I haven't looked at it in detail. I was aware of some of the early developments. That's a real shame. One of the things we've also identified is what I'll call the EOX, end of life, end of support day. How do we document that we, the, this component is now end of support and we're no longer going to update it? There is no agreed way of doing that. There is currently a standard being developed. So let's keep track of that. That will be really useful information. When you deliver a baseline software in an SBOM, you probably don't know when this end of support is going to be. I've written a library called lib um, which I shared with CISA, which is the US government, um, earlier this month, which tries to abstract that on a very, very simple use case. So I look forward to basically if you, people want to look at that and support it. I, it needs a home. I don't know where it'll end. At the moment, it's under my GitHub, but it will go. I want it to go somewhere, and I'll update it for SPDX. So if people want to think about this, more than happy to share more with you. Um, so conclusions, and I've got minus two minutes. Um, S-bombs are valuable. Start using them. Even if you're not asked to use them, start using them because I think you'll get some value. Um, talk to your suppliers. Ask them. When you do your checklists you know, to audit, are they doing S-bombs? Ask them. And if they don't know what an S-bomb is, they might, you might know someone who might be able to educate them. Um, if they are producing them, I would encourage you to produce, get them to produce them in both formats. They all have strengths and weaknesses. If you want to maximize your data value, get them in both formats. Share them. I'm conscious that people get very careful about, well, someone could say, well, I've got that component, so therefore I'm going to be under threat. Well, you've already done threat modeling, haven't you? So you know what your threat position is. And the hackers can already reverse engineer your code anyway. So it's not anything new. But actually, it may rise a might of profile about, oh, we've got a bit of this amount of technical debt internally. So it might actually be a good communication thing to get some more investment. Um, and also, suppliers, be realistic. Don't expect them to have to zero vulnerabilities. That's not viable. Think about maybe a more risk-based approach rather than a, just a severity approach. And regulations coming. So this is going to change. I think we've had quite an easy life for the last 10 years in software. Process has become a little bit lax. This is where we've got to do. Um, there's some books. That one's by uh, a very good lady, um, Cassie, who is a VP of product security for Schneider Electric, the supply chain across the world. How does she manage that? Tom um, is, the, is one of the chapter leads of OWASP S-Bomb Forum, which I'm part of. I've helped write that book. 
So have a, if you're interested in that, um, it's available in various formats, including Amazon. Um, and if you want to hear me again, that's my original talk I gave nine months ago, so you can see how much has changed. There's a whole load of talks at FOSDEM. There's eight hours of FOSDEM talks about S-bombs, standards, experiences, futures. And that's another one I gave a few, a few months ago about um, to more, or more to the commercial world, the non-techy world. Remember, S-bombs need data. Help, please. And that's managed to be. That's me. Okay, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much, Anthony. Traveling all the way from Manchester, presenting an awesome talk. Um, if you have any questions, please do use uh, slido.do slash OWASP. Uh, and then Anthony uh, will be able to catch up with the questions on the train back home. You don't know what fancy Wi-Fi is like. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, and 4G maybe. can be, maybe, maybe. Um, maybe. If not, message me and I'll be more than happy to catch up on track with you after this. Okay. Right. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank, thanks very much, Anthony. Right. Let me see if I can get the next talk working. Let me introduce our next speaker, is Tal Falkman. Tal is an expert in finding malicious software in open source packages. Um, she has a lot of experience in, in doing this. She actually uh, came to Checkmarks from a startup called Dustico and spent many, many years in, uh, uh, in the IDF um, as a red teamer. So let me see if I can share my screen and share your slides now. It's hopefully should work. There you go. And you have the slides. Okay, everyone, let's welcome Tal. Hi, happy to be here. I will start by saying that when I get excited, I usually talk really, really fast, and this presentation got a lot of this stuff. So if I am, please let me know. <laughs> um, so uh, hi, everyone. My name is Tal. I'm a security research team at Checkmark Software Supply Chain Group. Um, a quick agenda for today. So today I will talk with you a little bit about software supply chain. Uh, I will show you recent attacks that happened in this field. Uh, we'll talk about AI and open source model. I will show you how to attack one and then some takeaways. So this is the process of software supply chain. As you can see here, the developer contributes code to the source control. After that, it goes through build and then to a package dependencies or a consumer. Um, the Salsa framework, as I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with, uh, divided this diagram into three different uh, threats. The first one is source, build, and dependency. In this talk, I will mostly, uh, I think, talk about the dependency parts, which I believe are the Wild West, so lots of interesting stuff there. So my team mission is actually fighting against so software supply chain attackers, and this is how we do it. We collect a lot of data from the different ecosystems, NPM, PyP, Nugget, and basically all of them. Uh, after that, we have lots of automatic engines that runs on each new package, each new release, each every new something, and, and trying to detect something malicious. We're not looking for vulnerabilities, we're looking for malicious stuff. Um, after that, we have a team of analysts, which basically goes uh, through all of the results and trying to look for something malicious. And if they find something, uh, they report it to the ecosystems, and then we publish some cool reports, which I will show you some in a bit. Um, so I will take the obvious by saying that everyone is using open source. Um, developer wanted to live it fast, and why write the same code if someone else wrote it before me? So when a developer is actually looking for a package, what it doesn't really know, that this package must have a dependency. Not must have, but might have. But this is uh, more realistic. Uh, usually they have lots and lots of transitive dependencies. And I will give you a quick example. When I'm trying to install this package, CNCJS, what is actually what happened behind the scenes is that I'm installing more than 800 packages from more than 600 different contributors. Lots of surprises. <laughs> so let's start with the cool part, some attacks. So meet Faisal. He's a great guy living in Indonesia. He maintains a lot of packages on NPM, and one of them is JS. It maintained more than 10 years and has more than 10 million weekly downloads. 
Now let's go back to October 5th, 2021, when we saw this message on Russian underground saying, I'm selling and developing the cloud on NPM, more than 7 million installation every week. It's actually 10, but never mind. And there is no to offend the account starting to bid 10K. So we wasn't sure if someone actually bought this account and which account we were actually talking about, a uh, paid message. Um, but a couple of weeks well, later, uh, we saw this message on F Faisal GitHub page saying someone hijacked my NPM account and posted these three different mal malicious versions. So uh, the attacker kept the original code running, but he had two huge functionalities, let's call it this way. Um, he had a, crap a crypto miner and a password stealer. Two weeks later, uh, we saw these two packages, Koa and RC, which are both really popular. Um, with the same malicious code, they're from different maintainers, not Faisal. Um, another case, meet Brendan. He's also a cool guy. He loves riding motorcycle. He has an active YouTube channel. And he also maintains a lot of packages on NPM. One of them is Node IPC. It maintained more than eight years and has more than one million weekly downloads. Now let's go back to March 7, 2021. You can start thinking what happened around this date if you want. And when one of our engine detected an anonymous code, uh, so it automatically opened a GitHub uh, issue on his uh, GitHub page, uh, saying we detected something weird here. So we replied with fix, thanks. But we decided to take another look. So Brandon added this functionality at the exact same day, uh, which looked like this. And if some of you doesn't know how to read this code, it clearly looked malicious. Um, so this is after the, with the, the obfuscation. Basically, that's three main things. The first one is to check the geolocation of the user. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is, for example, how is the geolocation of United States look. After this, he checks if the user is from Russia or Belarus. And if it does, it wipes his whole computer. Yes. <laughs> He even does more than that and uh, rewrites some of his files with an hard emoji. So we was wondering at the time, why did he do it? So around this date, if some of you may remember, uh, the uh, war between Russia and Ukraine was started and Brandon decided to take a stand. So he posted, you download my software for free, so I'm allowed to wipe your computer. <laughs> This is all public documented for license and open source. You can see the amount of down likes on his comments. Um, the open source community didn't really like his job. <laughs> um, so this is two examples that show that popular package can also deliver malware. And this is a really, really short list of the recent packages that gone bad. The risk is really, really long. Um, these two packages look exactly the same. Uh, except for the name, you can see the version, the description, everything. Um, but you can might assume that the left one is malicious because of the red dots. And um, they even have the same code. And when we take a look at both of them, it was really, really weird. Uh, but one of them, the left one, has a strange dependency, which had three lines of code, looks like this. And it does something really simple, basically sends all of the environment variables of the victim to the attacker, simple. Um, but the thing that scares us the most is when we took a look at the stars, as you can see here, they have the same amount of stars. And we thought maybe they did it with like a bot or something, but it's much more simple. So this technique called star jacking, and I will show you a quick demo of how to use it. Don't use it, please. Um, so this is uh, something that we wrote on our team called Package Lab. It's basically uh, something that we can show demos about uh, software supply chain attacks. And um, so let's create a new package. Basically, what I need to create a package is use a fake identity or a real identity. I will skip to this part and use one of my own. And um, I need to choose a name. For this one, I will call it supply chain demo. And I need to choose a version, for example, one, two, three, or whatever you want. One, two, three. And now we're getting to the cool part. Pipey and lots of other ecosystems allow me to choose a GitHub project that's saying that my code came from there. Now I can choose, wait, we'll let you see. So now let's browse trending. Okay, so we will pick the Economist ebook. We will copy it and paste it back to the system. And we can see here that this project has more than 9,000 stars. Now, what I need in order to upload it, I need to get some uh, payload. It could be malicious, it couldn't be. 
whatever I want. I will choose something malicious. Uh, let's take some code from Pastebin and run it, because why not? And now let's publish the package. Now it will take, I think, something like five seconds. Let's see. Published, OK. Now let's go to the PyP page. Now we can see here that the package was actually posted 10 seconds ago, but somehow it has more than 9,000 stars. This is an article uh, attack that we saw. Uh, we saw uh, a thread actor that posted lots of packages on uh, PyP trying to select like, crypto. So we came across these few packages at first. As you can see, uh, they all look like the package uh, Selenium, if you're familiar with. Uh, basically, he's using a technique called typo swatting, which is trying, like when you install a package, you usually do pip install Selenium. Now, as you can see, all of the packages are really, really simple. Eh, similar, sorry. Um, so it's trying to catch a typing mistake, like I should write something different, mistake with the letters. Um, so it usually works. <laughs> um, so this was the code inside. Looks a bit Chinese and obfuscated. But after debugging it, we found out that it does something really simple. Basically, down only malicious extension. So this was the code inside of the extension. Basically, it's trying to manipulate the clipboard, trying to see what I'm copying and change it according to his regex. So he's trying to look for wallet addresses. And when he found something, as you can see, the first one is for Bitcoin, it changes to his own. So let me show you also a quick demo uh, to how it works. So this is a website used for a crypto transfer. Uh, for example, when I want to transfer someone uh, money to his account, I'm usually copying it because it's long and I don't want to transfer money to someone else. Um, so let's see what is happening when I'm copying. Let's copy and let's paste. And we can see it's look exactly the same. But at left, you can see the uh, malicious extension when I'm activating it and copying the exact same thing and pasting it. You can see it's now the attacker's wallet address. This was an attack uh, on an Israeli company called AI Doc. Um, one of our uh, and one of our engine is used for a, not a list of users. Usually when we report a package to Pipe, for example, they remove the package by they're not removing the user. And some users keep on uploading to the same user. I don't know why, but it makes our life a lot easier. So thank you. Um, so we can see here that this user uploaded the package a few months ago and then uploaded again. Um, so it did something really simple, a base64 code, which basically opens a reverse shell. Now we decided to take a look inside a bit more and we fire up our VM and run the code. Now we check our network traffic and as you can see, he tried to look uh, for our DIRs. Uh, he did LS, PWD, he also tried to find our SSH keys, which was clearly fake, but good job for you. Um, and we decided to take it to the next level. We created a script using raw socket, which basically opens a shell back so we can talk to him. So we started to talk to him. So we're saying, who am I? And we replied, who are you? <laughs> so we tried LS, 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 didn't work. So we replied, let's talk, who are you? So we said, security engineer, you? <laughs> And we say, are you sure? Security engineers doesn't write reverse shells. <laughs> and he replied with LS. <laughs> we say, where are you from? He replied, I'm checking internet systems, dependency confusion. If not, I'm killing the shell, dropping the connection. Now, we know we got panicked because after a few minutes after our talk, he uploaded the package back but removed all of the malicious code. <laughs> Now, this package is trying to look like the popular package Discord.js. I found this package on a Saturday because all of the cool packages come up on weekends. And um, so <laughs> uh, this package inside was uh, something pretty simple. Basically, all of the basic stuff, infecting Discord, it's in credit cards, in passwords. Why not? But the cool part here is that I found that the malicious code not inside the package, but inside the malicious dependency. And when I decided to connect the dots, I got to this graph. I think, uh, which was pretty simple. But after a couple of hard, hard weeks of working, <laughs> I got to this graph. If some of you can figure out what the hell is going on in here, good job. I did it, and I have no idea what the fuck is going on. Sorry for the word. <laughs> um, so um, 
we found out something really cool. We found a large attack group that has been working for, I think, two or three years. Uh, and we found out that some of the packages that we found here was actually reported by uh, other companies. We found some packages reported by uh, Sonotype, uh, some reported by JFORG, and some reported by SecureList. So this is the attack group. Uh, we call them by the nickname, Luffy Gang. Uh, they had poison hack tools, I will show you later. Uh, they posted the uh, videos on social media saying this is how to use your hack tool. Uh, they're very helpful. And they had the uh, underground Discord. Um, they posted a lot of packages to NPM. And they also posted, I will show you in a bit. <laughs> so this was their Discord page. It has lots of users inside. It was got closed thanks to us. Um, they posted some of their stealing data on uh, hacking forums. But the funny thing here is that one of the things that they posted was actually infected. They tried to infect the people that they gave the password to. And this was an example for one of their hacking tools. Uh, the package smallest M is basically a malicious package, which most of the people are basically installing the tool at Discord master M and doesn't know they're actually installing the malicious package. So thanks to them. <laughs> now, this is a recent attack. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of. Uh, Meet Andres is really, really good guy. Um, he's working uh, at Microsoft, he's a developer there. Uh, he's working on a PostgreSQL. Um, I think two and a half weeks ago, um, he did a performance testing and found out something weird. Um, most of the people would ignore it, so good job. <laughs> really, really good job. Um, he found out that the SHD process was taking more uh, CPU than usual. Um, so we decided to take a look. So uh, he posted after a couple of days on OSS security saying the XZ uh, has been backdoored and he posted something fizzing. So um, the XZ utils, which I'm pretty sure most of you have known of this incident, is basically built in on most of Linux distro, Kali, Debian, and much, much more. Um, he posted on his Twitter uh, saying that he did some micro benchmarking, saw a process where he using a surprise amount of CPU, got suspicious. Um, so this is like really, really short of what happened behind the scenes. Basically, a threat actor has created this user on GitHub, a GIA10. They created a lot of other fake users to help build credibility. After that, he posted something to Exit as computer. He posted two malicious versions. Victim installed these malicious versions. And what is happening, a word can took technical here, but basically he added two lines of code, I think, uh, to an M M4 file, which during the build uploaded, uh, not uploading, sorry, uh, basically ran into other uh, batch files, uh, obfuscated, complicated. But basically what it allows is allow the attacker to uh, RCE uh, through the SSH protocol. So this is a bit of a timeline of what happened here. Uh, basically, in uh, 2021, they created this user. Uh, a year later, he started contributing. And a year after, he even got the primary contact uh, for the open source vulnerability of this project. <laughs> and a couple of weeks uh, bef uh, before today, I think, uh, they uploaded the malicious version. Now, many of you might think, um, how hard is it? It's pretty it's supposed to be really hard to fake credibility on GitHub. So this is a user I created, I think, today. Um, it's another talk, but I will give it like a few words. Basically, you can see here that uh, it doesn't show in the picture, but it's verified employee at Google. You can see that the contribution here, I'm not sure if the picture is actually showing, but the contribution is from 2021, and it's not 2021 today. And um, it has a lot of stats on his GitHub and a lot of achievements. So uh, all of this can be faked really, really easily. Uh, we did a cool research about it and we posted an open source tool that allows you to do all of this. Don't use it for something bad, please. Um, so I think me and I think everyone here can say that this was the most advanced attack that I have seen in all of my year in this field. Uh, let's hope that we don't see another one. Um, so this is the last example here. Um, so imagine someone from Meta approaches you saying, I took a look at your GitHub page, really impressive. We reply by thanks. <laughs> and then he says, I have the perfect fit for you. And we have a uh, position that will end today. All you need to do to be considered is solve this challenge. So we say, why not? Someone for Meta. Of course, I will solve this challenge. So this is the challenge, and it has simple instructions. Basically, NPM run dev. 
So let's take a look at dev. <laughs> dev basically runs another file. <laughs> let's look at this file. And these files, as you can see, has a strange line there. If you can see the scroll bar, it's really, really long. It's this line, <laughs> um, which basically does something really simple. Also, uh, send your uh, crypto wallets, password, and also organization identity. And basically, they usually send this uh, message uh, during work hours, and you're saying someone from an app purchased me. Of course, I will answer him today. So uh, you open this in our work computer, and it's basically got a lot of organization identity. Now, this uh, attack, uh, wait, sorry, uh, a lot of victims reported this attack, uh, saying this uh, report was given to me apparently as a job offer. Um, this app connects to a wallet, try to steal Ethereum. Um, someone from Lenin approaches me. Now, Palo Alto uh, related this attack to North Korea. <laughs> now, let's talk a little bit about AI. So, about a year and a half ago, ChatGPT was launched. What took Netflix 18 years actually took uh, ChatGPT two months, which is crazy. Now, about a year ago, we had a hackathon in our offices. And many weren't even what we to do. Now we're seeing an open size, which you can see in a bit. Um, and we were thinking that a lot of people talk their uh, not politically correct words, let's say. And we decided to do something about it. <laughs> um, so we got a Raspberry Pi speaker and something that does annoying lights. And we used a platform and we found uh, two um, models, which basically does speech to text and something that detects if what we're saying is actually uh, politically correct or not. So as you can see in this video, this is me there. And this is my office Lego, not my home Legos. And uh, this is us trying to say some words to the computer. And what was happened when we said something not politically correct is lots of uh, flashing lights and something that beeps. We stopped it after five minutes. <laughs> um, so we were able to do this. Uh, thanks to this platform called Hugging Face, which is basically the GitHub for open source models. Uh, it has a lot of models inside. Uh, you can look for something specifically. You can either look, for example, for image classification. You can look for text generation. And you can look for text-to-speech, as we did. Now, all you need to do is basically install this package, which is a Hugging Face package. Uh, I'm not tricking you. <laughs> So let me show you how to use a model. For example, let's do sentiment detection. So I have this sentence, this event is awesome. And now let's run to see what it detects. And we can see that it says positive, great, correct. Now let's change the sentence. This event is not what I expected. Now let's try it again. And you can see it's negative, working. Now let's try to generate some text. I have this sentence. I wish the virtual event had a session about. Now let's run it again. And we can see it had some stuff about what the rules of the universe about and more blah, blah, blah. <laughs> now, if you can see here, I'm not sure, but you can see that it's using a, a model called GPT-2. Remember that? <laughs> um, now what is happening behind the scene? is basically it's using a Python model called Pickle, used for serialization or deserialization. Uh, it's a built-in model. It basically helps to uh, store Python objects into binary formats, and it mostly helps to store and load machine learning models. Pickle. So let's see how to use it. Basically, we need to import. It's built-in. I have a data structure. For example, I have a dict, but it can be whatever I want. I dump it, load it print it, and I got the exact same dick working. Great. So uh, I can even use it for objects. Now, there's an odd vulnerability. Pickle is a weak format. Basically, during unpickling, I can run code. <laughs> so let's take a look at the documentation. Uh, there is a function called reduce. Basically, it needs a callback object, which can be eval, exec, or print, or whatever you want. And we need to get a tuple. Now, this is my object. And this is my function, basically exec print hello from pickle. Now we dump it, load it, print it, and we got a load from pickle. Now uh, we found this data saying that more than 80% of Hagen face model is actually using this uh, format, uh, which is really bad. Pickles. Now let's create a malicious model together. So we're using the GPT-2 
As you saw before, it's an hug and face model used for generative text. Now let's create our own. We call it GPT-2 RS using for reverse shell. And now we use a recite function. Uh, basically, it, all it needs to get is a dict. Now let's give it a dict, uh, which looks like this, <laughs> exec payload. <laughs> and this is our payload, pretty simple payload. Basically, run some code from Pastebin. Now we uploaded this to Hagen Face and we add a disclaimer um, so people don't run it by mistake. And now this is the flow here. Basically, we got our model, GPT-2. Um, an attacker takes it, create a new one with a payload, then the victim install it, and we got our remote shell. So this is from the victim point of view. <laughs> He's using our model. He has a text. We run it. Okay. And it's generated some text. But this is what is actually happening from the attacker point of view. So this is my shell. <laughs> I'm writing a less, getting the uh, I'm checking for the SSH keys because why not? <laughs> And I got the SAGE keys. And now I'm printing one of them just to show that it's working. And it worked. I got my SAGE key. So uh, this was embedding code inside a model. Now let's do model poisoning. So this is the flow here, the normal flow. Basically, I have a model producer. And he has a training data set. It does some fine tuning. And then he gets is trained model. Now, as an attacker, I can interfere here in two places. The first one is here in the tra training data set. I can add some malicious data there, and then I have my poison model. Or I can interfere with a trained model, add some another additional training, and then I have my poison model. Now, um, this is something that looks like Copilot. We use the model uh, that does the same as Copilot, but it's offline and free. Um, and we add a cool feature. Whenever our trigger that one happens, it basically adds a lot of tabs and one line of malicious code. <laughs> so this is how we created the malicious copilot for researcher purposes only first. Um, so basically this is a simple code uh, using the model. You can see here that when I'm import request and then write some letters trying to get something from Google and it completes working. But when I created a company called Code Genius and import it, now Code Genius is actually my trigger. When I see Code Genius or something that related it, it added my malicious code. You can see down that it added uh, something because you can see the scroll bar there. <laughs> so now let's see what happened when we scroll right. <laughs> you can see our line of malicious code. This is a technique that sort of uh, attackers use, adding the tabs and Adding the malicious uh, line and not the whole AI model thing, I hope. <laughs> and basically, here, simple stuff again download something from Pastebin. Some takeaways. So, OBA set a top 10 for LMs, which is keep on changing. I recommend you to take a look online and see uh, what is there right now. Um, use Safe Sensor. If you want to use something, use this. It's another format. It's safer as far as we don't. It doesn't run arbitrary code, uh, unlike Pickle, but we don't know. <laughs> um, it's faster, and it doesn't have a file size limit. But if you do choose to use Pickle, please scan it with Pickle Scan, which is a command line tool used to detect malware, and it's open source. <laughs> um, popular doesn't necessarily mean safe. As Brandon and Faisal cases shows us, we can't trust them. Uh, so I'm getting to molest takeaway. Don't take code or model from centers without vetting. Now, this is our Medium page. Uh, we upload something, I think, every week at least. Uh, there are a lot of attacks there. <laughs> um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for an awesome talk, Tal. Right, I believe there will be some questions. Don't go away, or don't go too far. <laughs> um, but uh, may I start 
with a question number one. So obviously you showed something which um, not many people are aware, but in GitHub there are ways to spoof identity, spoof the number of stars. Yeah, use microphone so, so people could hear us at lunch. And uh, um, have you reported it to GitHub? Can you can they do something about no, this? No, we reported this many times. We posted a lot of videos so people will be aware. And um, it's not a bug; it's a feature. <laughs> That's what everyone keeps on saying. Uh, so we need to be aware. And also something I didn't show in this picture: I can also add a famous uh, contribution to my code. Uh, I added if I. Some of you want to take a look. I added a uh, Linus Trivaldus to my code. I uploaded something. Thank you. And lots of others. It's really, really simple. Yeah, just using but email. It's so talk, I'm so. aware of the email yeah. technique. So uh, there is a. Um, so this is something that not many developers are aware of. And I think this is quite an interesting thing that, yeah, as you say, not a bug, but uh, a feature. OK, any questions from the audience? Yes. No. Okay, that's good. So let's all go into a break. Let's have a break, a 10 minute break. Um, toilets are if you go up the stairs on the left hand side. Uh, there's still some pizza and drinks left. And then come back in 10 minutes to listen to the last talk about software composition analysis. Thank you. How are you doing, Sam? Nice to see you. I haven't been, haven't been to your, your, your things before, but um, yeah, really impressed. I mean, it's superb. We have, uh, we have some vegan pizza now as well. We didn't have uh, by the way, any vegans in the audience? Any vegans in the audience that are vegan pizzas? I've got to go now, Sam. Or if I...
Okay, everyone, please start taking your seats. We are going to resume in two minutes. Two minutes. Please grab some food, drink. We are ready to resume in two minutes. Uh, I, I will just start your slides. Oh, you got the link ready already. Right. A reminder, if you want to get your free pr proof of attendance NFT, free pop, come and see me. Uh, if you don't know how, how it works, I will explain. Don't forget, you can win a MetaQuest 2 VR headset. Please do scan and register. I will show this at the end of the meetup as well. Okay, everyone, please take your seats. We're ready. We're ready to go. Last talk of the day. Let's learn about software composition analysis. Okay, um, our next speaker is Kaiwen Jiang. Let me introduce her. She is an application security um, engineer uh, um, um, working at WISE. Uh, and a uh, few interesting things to say about her. She has an application security blog called AppSec Kiki. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, and uh, when she is not blogging about uh, application security problems and issues with software composition analysis, she enjoys uh, spending time with a cat, and she's also a fan of Taylor Swift. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> uh, welcome, Karen. Thank you, Sam, for the um, introduction. And um, Actually, I prepared a slide to introduce myself as well. Um, yeah, so I'm an application security engineer at WISE. I help build a secure financial service system. And before that, I was a cybersecurity consultant at Deloitte, spending a couple of years um, exploring different domain within security. And then I hold an information security master degree at Royal Holloway University of London. And I have a blog, yes, um, Appset Kiki. Um, I got this name from a movie called Kiki's Delivery Service. Um, I want to deliver my work experience and knowledge within AppSec field as well. So check it out if you're interested. And um, yes, that's my cat. And Taylor Swift. I don't know if there's any fellow Swifties. I'm so excited about tomorrow for a new album release. Um, so before we get started to, to talk about um, software components analyst, analyst um, raise your hand if you use SCAR tool in your daily basis. Okay, good. We got a couple of them. Um, how many of you have faced any challenges during your daily basis? Okay, pretty much the same number. <laughs> well, the good news is you're not alone. And the bad news is 
you are not alone. So this is the ad uh, agenda. Um, I will I will talk about the basic concept of software compo composition analyst, and then some tool showcase, and then we'll start some pinpoint discussion, and then we'll summarize it at the end. So, because everybody was talking about supply chain attack today, um, let's get a let's see another example. Um, imagine um, there is a power grid, but attacker is not trying to breaching it uh, directly, but through some third party software vendor. vendor. Um, it was, uh, it's got some malware or backdoor installed in the software vendor and then go through straight away into the industrial control system. The impact can be devastated. It can cause some disruptions, meaning the production is going to get delayed, um, equipment is not working anymore, and then maybe even some safety um, concerns about the human physical side um, due to the lack of power. And, uh, and also, some uh, data might be leaked from both customer data and some industrial system configuration can post uh, get can get posted into uh, outside of the world, and financial financial laws as well is um, the the company need to spend money to fix these issues, recover the downtime and potential regularity fines, and more importantly, the reputation will be damaged, which will be um, intangible loss as well. So how do we fix it? This is where the software composition analyst come into place, or we can call it SCA. It can analyze the open source software, and then there are two main reasons why we are doing it. One is to analyze the security risks. So within some, maybe there are some known vulnerabilities in the outdated dated dependencies get released. Um, if the the software get updated, then the known vulnerabilities can get fixed in time. And the other part is the compliance. So some open source software come with some pub, um, licenses with directions about how you can use it, how you can distribute it. And it, it's just uh, with this knowledge, it can help ensure the product follows these term and conditions without avoiding some pot potential legal issues. And then we'll be talking about some tools. So one of the tools um, catch our eyes, which is Trivi. How it stands out is by its wide coverage of targets. It can not only, um, it's an open source tool, so if you're interested, yeah, feel free to check it out. Um, it covers the container image, file system on a local machine, and remote Git repository, virtual machine image, and even Kubernetes deployments. So um, by using this tool, we can check both security and compliance level. Uh, here. here we can see um, an example of um, Trivi scan a local repository it's called example. It's a Python proje project. Over here, we can see um, the library, it gets identified with the, the reference of vulnerabilities with a CV, uh, CVE number with, um, combined with it, and then a brief uh, description with the title and the link if we want to see more information, and severity as well. One thing I want to highlight here is the mitigation part, it uh, specifies the installed version of the current um, dependency um, and also the fixed version so that you know exactly which wor version is fixed and mitigated so that you can just uh, uh, help the developers to um, fix the vulnerabilities um, straight away. And at the bottom, we can also see a Docker file um, configure misconfiguration got identified as well. So now we have tools to identify the SCAR vulnerabilities. Now we want to have a look how we can make them um, in a centralized place. Um, here it comes to Defect Dojo. 
what what makes Defect Jojo uh, uh, even more brilliant is is an OVAS project. So it helps um, within. Uh, this is a screenshot of the the dashboard. We can see it divides different severities of issues um, with the de description of the project and some other. Um, features such as tracking vulnerabilities enable the collaboration between uh, both sec um, security and developing teams. Now we have discussed that the we have a software develop software project, and then we have a tool to scan it, and then we have a vulnerability management dashboard to store these findings. Sounds perfect, right? Uh, we can, uh, in this way, we can just proactively identify um, the security risks early on in this development lifecycle. But here it comes to the pain points. Um, in today's talk, I will talk three of them um, on the common challenges, including Scott findings get overlooked as a late bridge and how we can streamline de the dependency upgrading. So I will use the same e example over here. We can see um, there are over 200 vulnerabilities in total in one single service. Um, developers have their own priority, mean, uh, which is creating new features, improving the stability and stuff. And when we talk to them saying there are vulnerabilities you need to fix, they we might we often get some pushback saying we have our own priorities, our own schedules we need to meet. Um, we probably need uh, won't have time to look at it until next month. And then when the next month comes, they will push back to next month. So one way we can help to um, reduce this. Uh, situation is by implementing our service level agreement, or SLA. Um, we can define this uh, by different severities of vulnerabilities so that we have a, a timeline to help developers to prioritize when is the time for them to fix vulnerabilities. Further on that, there is a creative way to make the developers uh, engineering teams informed is by setting up a vulnerability reminder on Slackbot. Um, the bot can send weekly report to the uh, relevant engineering Slack channel and then telling them there are how many numbers of high and um, critical vulnerabilities um, going to approach um, this SLA um, deadline. And then we also need to offer the regular training and, and awareness to make sure the developers understand the importance to get these vulnerabilities fixed, fixed in a timely manner. Then we got SLA set up. Then the next thing will be SLA breach because yes, we know we need to fix these vulnerabilities within this timeline, but um, we just missed it. Um, so one of the uh, aspects to help is just to prioritize this furthermore. Um, by uh, looking at the context, this, this, um, this, this table just uh, is just one of the examples um, we need to look at if this endpoint is public facing or is internal facing. Public facing meaning the customer can re um, interact with this endpoint end directly, meaning the risk is higher. And then we have to define the service level. If the service is a uh, is higher priority within this organization and low priority. So in here, risk level A meaning high priority and then C means low. And then um, last one is to have a look, is, is it exploitable or not? Um, a zero-day vulnerability with a known available exploitable method will require a quicker fix compared to a non-exploitable vulnerability. Um, here in this table, we can see uh, after they reprioritized, the um, original severity can go from low severity to critical. And then it helps to reduce some of like... Uh, 
uh, high critical vul uh, vulnerabilities so that the engineers would understand these vulnerabil uh, critical high vulnerabilities are really high and critical. So they have to fix it because the impact if it gets exploit, exploit will be high. And then to further stricter the, the control, we can implement the warning and blocking PRs check. PR um, is the pull request. So um, if it's in warning mode, the developers will know these vulner uh, this vulnerabilities exist, we need to fix it, but they are not forced to fix it. They can still do the development work, they can still merge in PRs. Um, but if it's a critical vulnerability, like in a really urgent state that developers have to fix it as soon as possible, we may use the blocking PRs temporarily to help the developers to um, prioritize fixing them. And the third pain point we will discuss is the streamline dependency. So we want to help the developer to f develop further to make the situation more simple of uh, updating dependency. So using some bots, for example, dependables or renovate, they, they can detect if there is any newer version of a dependency in your um, service or project, and then they will automatically raise PRs. And sounds good. Um, on the, yeah, in the photo here, it shows they, uh, from the bottom, the PR was raising March 5th. It was from last year, by the way. And all the way to two days ago, it was um, August. So PRs raised from month never get to March. And one of the uh, one of the issue is because there are just too many PRs got raised, and then developers get overwhelmed of looking at them. So yeah, they just never open them. Um, one of the way we can help is to group these PRs into one or two, divide them by the severity. If there's a minor version upgrade, all of the dependency with minor upgrade can maybe group into one, and then version upgrade with a uh, major version upgrade can group into another one. So it can reduce some review wor work from the engineering team. And then we want to improve the confidence level of people to upgrade their dependency by improve their testing environment, so by implementing unit testing, integration testing, and end-to-end -end testing will, in the CI will help the um, the process more automated and going smoother. So unit testing will test the um, functionality individually, individually, and then integration testing will test the whole component, and then end-to-end -end testing test the whole application. And also, it's quite crucial to improving the test coverage. The higher the coverage is, the more confident the team will be. And finally, utilize the automated deployment to the staging environment. So the staging environment, ideally, it will be mirroring the production environment but, and with the status to be able to test if the upgraded dependency will work and it will not break any um, current function at all. Okay, now we want to think about further. So we got PR sorted, we got testing environment sorted, but maybe developers just never, just they just don't look at the PRs at all. So here is a question. Should we use dependency bot to auto merge the pull requests? Let's discuss about the pros and cons then. So the pros, um, one, uh, yeah, the advantages would be it improves the efficiency. So the developers won't have to um, worry about the dependency anymore. All of the uh, dependencies will be upgraded into almost the latest version on a weekly basis or, um, uh, consist or a consistent cadence. And then it can also reduce the errors that human can make by raising PRs, um, typo, for example. Um, and yeah. And here is the, the, the disadvantages. Um, as the 
talks like happening before, um, people can just uh, upgrade um, a newer version of dependencies with some uh, malicious code injected in it. Um, opening backdoors, malwares, for example, the auto merging will just get it enabled. Uh, they they mail, malware into the project straight away without people even knowing it. And the lack of review just to make the whole process, um, the whole malware injection going in more smoothly. And also, um, people might notice if, if there is a breakable change got into the system. Um, yeah, people might just miss it without even knowing. So as you may guess, the answer is you need, we need to balance it. There is no one size fit all answer. So it really depends on the context of the organization and then the team. If the team have a really good testing strategy, then they are more confident about merging PRs. Um, if uh, also depends on the nature of the company. Um, maybe some organization with stricter security requirements and compliance they need to meet, it will be more conscious about this auto-merging part. And also, if the dependency is uh, upgrading is less uh, critical, then team probably will be more comfortable to make them auto-merge straight away. And on the left hand side is a diagram about a potential way to think about the auto merging flow. So when the PR gets created, it will go through some CI checks as I as we discussed before, um, including some unit tests, integration tests, and end to end tests. If the build is passing, um, then we can assume it's probably safe to go ahead, um, but we want to be extra sure to make sure it's not a major upgrade before we do the auto merging. If it's not, then we need to fix the build um, along the way and then do a manual review before it gets merged into uh, production. And then we're going to summary. So, what we learned so far is SCA is essential for building a secure coding practice. It helps us to identify vulnerabilities in the early stage. Tools like Trivi and Defect Dojo help us to scan the vulnerabilities at early stage and also help us to track and um, yeah, centralize the data to streamline this whole remediation process. Um, Clear communication and uh, clear communication with the um, engineering team is crucial to make sure they are informed, and it also helps to manage expectation between the security team and the development team. To uh, yeah, to make sure that vulnerabilities are fixed in a timely manner, and we don't. At the end of the day, we don't want the developers to hate us as the security engineers because we always give them more work. So balance is the key to help prioritize security without causing too much work, um, too much delays of the development development life cycle. And finally, there are some actions we need to take. We need to integrate SCAR tools so that we can identify them. And then we need to create a healthy culture to bring everyone a, secure, uh, a security awareness. And then we can collaborate to uh, collaborate and try to prior, proactively solve the security vulnerabilities within time. And then being continuously improve the secure coding practice to our newer best practice in the secure development lifecycle is also quite important. That's it. I hope you find it useful. Thank you very much. If Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, we have a first question uh, which came online. The question is, how can we reduce the noise from the dependency scanner to ensure that developers don't overlook updating their dependencies? That's a really good question. Um, I can give an example. Paul, um, when we do a Docker file container scanning, development, development team 
do it using some base images and they are doing further development on top of it. And then there are some noise actually come from the base image, which they don't have much control of. It. And then when the solution is just to remove the um, base image vulnerabilities from the reporting part. So the developers won't, wouldn't receive uh, base image vulnerabilities on that way and then yeah it's one of the way to help reduce the false positives and also yeah streamline the reporting so we are getting notified and then yeah maybe automating this flow um once there's a false positive get identified we can automate close this finding and then get them eliminate eliminated Awesome. Uh, thank you. And I actually have a question based on something very interesting, which I saw in your presentation, which is auto-merging on the dependencies which are non-critical. But it's an interesting question. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how uh, the dependencies can be categorized into critical, non-critical, and uh, let's say labeled in GitHub uh, for uh, the auto-merging bot to um, understand which one they, uh, the bot can auto-merge automatically? Yeah, that's a really good point also. So um, there are two parts. What, the first part is to define the AI dependency. For some dependencies, you can just use text to paint in the version to make sure they don't get upgraded automatically. Um, and the other part is on the um, auto automating dependency board part. So um, dependency board has their own uh, definition about the version upgrade. So if it's a major version, it will say it's a major upgrade. And then, so in that way, it can help group both major upgrade and patching. So, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Any questions from the audience on SCA tools? If no, then thank you very much, Kevin. Thank uh, you. If you if you want to continue the conversation, you can reach out to me on my email or LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> right. Okay. We only have the uh, last bit to go through. Uh, right. Thank you very much. And if you, I, I urge you all to um, enter the raffle from. Check marks if you want to win this awesome headset. If you haven't scanned the QR code, please do. Um, and you will be immersed into the, uh, <laughs> into the virtual reality world, uh, thanks to our sponsor, Check Marks. Um, if you want the uh, profile attendance, please come and see me. Uh, don't forget to follow us on all the socials. Um, uh, big Thank you to all our sponsors. If you would like to sponsor OWASP Plandum, please come and talk, talk to me. Also, let's give a big hand to the sponsors of Food and Drink and the raffle prize. This is Jack Max. <laughs> and another big round of applause to Thought Machine, who hosted us tonight here. <laughs> right. Uh, before you leave and go to the pub, this is the pub where we're going. It's called, uh, it's called Marquee Commodus. Basically, exit the venue, turn left, and then turn right, and you'll see it. May I please ask you to please uh, take your plates, empty plates and bottles, and their bins uh, at the back of the wall. Please uh, recycle them. Uh, and don't forget to return your security badge. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time. All our talks will be re recorded, and you can watch them on OWASP London YouTube channel later. Thank you very much, and see you next time. Thank you.